So I want to welcome everyone to another School of Security Studies and International Affairs Journal sponsored New Voices in Global Security Lunchtime Seminar. My name is Amanda Chisholm and I'm the organizer and chair of this series. And I'm just admitting a few people, there we go. Right, so we are so pleased today to have Dr. Mark Kondos as our guest presenter. His talk is titled Emergency Exception and the Colonial Rule of Law in British India, 1800 to 1947. In this paper, Dr. Kondos critiques the current Eurocentric understanding of state governance offered by theorist Giorgio Agamben in his Concept State of Exception. Such understandings, Dr. Kondos argues, fails to take into account how racial differences that render colonial rule an inherent authoritarian and anti-democratic enterprise from the onset. Uh, it was core, that sort of was core to, to the ways in which the colonial rule um, uh, governed. Uh, the blurring of the executive legislation and judicial power that Agamemnon identifies with the state of exception were in fact, again, integral systemic features of colonial power. Using British India as a case study, Dr. Kondo seeks to reorientate our understanding of the state of emergency away from this framework of exception in order to consider how they may be more usefully considered as general techniques of colonial power. Uh, in doing so, he argues that rather than representing a point of rupture or change, the First World War simply offered an opportunity for the British colonial state to draw upon and expand an already extensive repertoire of coercive executive and legal practices that have been central to colonial control since the early 19th century. Dr. Kondos is a historian in the Department of War Studies. He is interested in the intersections between violence, race, and law within the British and French empires, with a particular focus on India and Algeria. He completed both his BA and MA at Queen's University in Canada. And in 2013, he received his PhD from the University of Cambridge. Prior to joining us at KCL, um, Dr. Kondos held a Leverhulme Early Career Research Fellowship at Queen Mary, University of London between uh, 2014 and 2017, and subsequently worked as a lecturer in Imperial and Global Histories between 2017 and 2020. His previous work has examined the relationship between militarism, violence, and state building in colonial Punjab and the Northwest frontier of India the important role of colonial anxieties and fear in justifying colonial violence, as well as the legal and discursive histories of colonial understanding of fanatical anti-colonial resistance. Currently, Dr. Kondos is working on a number of different projects, including a study of the commemorative history of the little known and Ajnala massacre in 1857, which I think is quite fascinating. Another piece of an abortive mutiny and coup d'etat against British rule in Southern India, allegedly orchestrated by deposed Indian uh, princes, as well as a longer comparative book project that explores how concepts of prestige, dignity and honor informed imperial practices of retributive justice and the ways uh, the different imperial powers attempt to justify um, these within legal, moral, and other normative frameworks. Dr. Kondos is joined today by Dr. Alistair McClure, who serves as his discussant. Alistair is a historian of modern South Asia and the British Empire. His research focuses largely on the relationship between violence, law, and sovereignty in the context of the 19th and 20th century India and the Indian Ocean world. His current publications tackle components of this wider question through the history of royal um, amnesty and corporal punishment. Before joining the University of Hong Kong, Dr. McClure um, completed fellowships at McGill University and the University of Chicago. His research has been supported by grants from the Arts and Humanities Research Council and British Academy. Currently, Alistair is working on his first book project, which examines the history of criminal law in colonial uh, India from 1857 to 1922. This focuses on the underlying tensions between the colonial state's reliance on arguments of exceptionalism and force on the one hand, and due process within the codified universal legal regimes on the other. Individual chapters within this book explore the codification of criminal law in India, judicial discretion in murder trials, the introduction of legislation of corporal punishment, forgiveness and mercy, the reinstatement of sedation laws, and the trials of Indian nationalists such as Mahatma Gandhi. 
uh, Dr. McClure's new project examines deportation and um, reparation in uh, the Indian Ocean. Framed around questions of who could be moved and where they can be moved to, this project draws on legal cases thrown up from the subaltern actors at the social and geographic peripheries of empire. Welcome to you both. Such a fascinating lineup. Um, I'm super excited for this presentation. So uh, the audience, um, how this is going to unfold is we're going to have Mark talk firstly for 20 minutes or so about his presentation. And then from there, we'll have Alistair come in with um, his discussant comments and questions before we open it up to you, the audience, for further questions or comments. You can either pose these questions or comments in the chat box and I can read them out loud to Mark, or you can raise your Zoom hand and ask them live. The choice is yours. Um, but yeah, for now, uh, and without um, further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to you, Mark. Uh, thank, thank you, Amanda, for the uh, introduction. And uh, thanks, everyone. So can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I thought I pressed the end mute. Uh, <laughs> thanks, everyone, for joining, uh, uh, Amanda, um, and uh, the rest of you. And I was just saying, uh, especially thanks to, to Alistair, uh, who's coming from Hong Kong, and I think it's past his bedtime, but he's going to soldier on and, and, and uh, offer us what I'm sure are very insightful comments. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here um, so you can see my slideshow. Can everyone see this all right? Okay. Uh, and Amanda, can you guys see the presentation view normally? Uh, no, we see the other view right now, Mark. All right. Let's see. How about now? Yes, perfect. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so the paper uh, I'm going to present today is uh, going to be part of a special uh, edition of First World War Studies. Uh, and as Amanda said already, um, the purpose of this issue is to essentially interrogate Giorgio Gambin's claims uh, that the First World War uh, and its immediate aftermath represented a crucial turning point in the history of uh, states of exception. Uh, so for Agamben, uh, World War I is important because of not only the sheer number of countries that declared states of emergency or siege during this conflict, um, but because it also, also opened up uh, an ostensibly new, radically anti-democratic way of thinking uh, and imagining uh, about state power. Um, so in this paper, I'd like to uh, sort of take Agamben to task by arguing that his framework is inherently Eurocentric uh, and fails to take into account how colonial rule was an inherently authoritarian uh, enterprise from uh, the outset, uh, essentially. Um, and to do this, I'm going to be using British India as a, a case study to explore how the blurring of executive, legislative, and judicial powers that Agamben identifies with the state of exception were, in fact, integral parts of colonial power. Um, and so in so doing, I'm hoping to reorient our understandings of states of emergency, uh, whether these be declarations of martial law, the suspension of habeas corpus, um, the enaction of repressive legislation, um, or the use of executive decrees and ordinances. And I'd like to move this away from the dominant framework of the exception that scholars are working with today in order to consider how these might more usefully be considered general techniques of colonial statecraft. Um, so as Amanda already said, instead of presenting First World War as a point of rupture or change, as Agamben does, I'm going to argue that it simply uh, it provided a new opportunity for the British colonial state to draw upon uh, an already extensive repertoire of coercive legal uh, and executive powers that had been central to colonial control since the early 19th century. Um, so during the past two decades, scholars have been increasingly attentive uh, to the way states deployed um, political and legal frameworks of emergency uh, in order to suspend, circumvent, uh, and essentially abrogate regular judicial processes, um, while at the same time conferring extraordinary executive powers upon uh, various agents charged with protecting um, the state from both its external and internal enemies. Um, and the apparent boundlessness of the contemporary war on terror, both in terms of its global reach and temporal indeterminateness in particular, has prompted a lot of urgent questions uh, about the harmful effects of a permanent state of emergency uh, and warfare upon society. Um, so if we look to the work of David Kennedy and Mary L. Dudziak, for instance, uh, both these thinkers have argued that what we're witnessing today is essentially the product of an increasing blurring between uh, war and peace, 
Uh, and for both of them, this is a, a problem that has characterized uh, the modern industrial world since the mid to late 19th century. Uh, war, they both argue, has essentially ceased to be a temporary interruption of the ordinary procedures um, that prevailed during peacetime and has instead become embedded into the institutions that govern uh, and regulate everyday life. Um, I argue, however, that Kennedy and Dudziak's uh, observations are based entirely on European and American perspectives uh, and experiences of war, and that if we adopt a more global outlook, a very different picture uh, emerges. Uh, so throughout the 19th and early 20th century, many of the key markers um, that helped uphold the hallowed boundaries between war and peace in the Western world, uh, whether this was distinctions between combatants and non-combatants, public and private actors, uh, and a set of legal principles um, about the agreed conduct in warfare. Um, all of these things were either already seriously blurred or altogether non-existent uh, in the imperial wars fought outside uh, the Western world. And as uh, Tarak Bakawi has pointed out, the way we conceptualize uh, differences between war and peace is through an inherently Eurocentric framework, uh, one that is ultimately untenable in the colonial world, which, as he argues, represented a form of sort of permanent war against the colonized. So in the colonial world, um, war, insurrection, and other kinds of emergency uh, requiring the suspension of so-called normal procedures of everyday life could potentially arise uh, at any moment. And thus, as the site of perpetual conflict, the colonial world provides us with a key way of examining these blurry boundaries uh, between uh, the so-called emergency powers of wartime uh, and the everyday uh, manifestations of this, these techniques during so-called uh, times of peace. Um, so scholars have been exploring these ideas for a while now, but what's striking is the extent to which so much of this work uh, is still dominated by the theories of Giorgio Agamben, uh, as well as those of Carl Schmitt, who Agamben um, built upon. Uh, both these thinkers come from a decidedly Eurocentric tradition, uh, and both wrote almost nothing uh, about the extra-European world. Um, if we look for the influences of these thinkers, uh, Achille Mbembe, for instance, uh, has used Agamben's theories to argue that the colonial world uh, was a zone of permanent exception uh, par excellence and represented a sort of form of absolute lawlessness in which the brutal violence of empire was enacted through um, unchecked sovereign discretion of colonial agents. Uh, and I argue that this uh, expansive characterization of colonial rule and violence uh, is really too reductive and ultimately inattentive to the myriad ways that law was actually quite central to the imperial project as a means of justifying colonial domination uh, and the indisputably um, violent practices that it often um, perpetrated. Um, so I think scholars like John and Jean Kamara, for instance, uh, have much more persuasively demonstrated that colonial regimes were actually deeply beholden to the law, um, especially in moments when they were seen to be transgressing it. Uh, so colonial violence was therefore enacted more not through the discretion of sovereigns, uh, but through the techniques of what they call lawfare, uh, the use of legal codes, um, charters, warrants, administrative regulations, uh, and states of emergency, all of which were used to render violence legible, legal, uh, and legitimate. Um, Nasser Hussein's work on states of emergency uh, in the colonial world is, is, is better than Mbembe's, in my opinion, but he still also relies heavily um, on the theories of both Agamben and Schmidt, and his work is essentially an attempt to resolve the apparent aporia um, between the avowed British commitment to the law um, alongside their frequent recourse to um, the use of sovereign discretionary powers during states of emergency. Um, for scholars like Lauren Benton, one of the key problems with these approaches is they hold Europe up as their telos rather than seeking to understand how the colonial world was the site for new kinds of legal innovation. And I believe uh, a more productive line inquiry lies down these roads um, and, and also following the work of, of John Reynolds, who's pointed out how the Schmidt-Agamben paradigm of sovereignty and law obscures the ways sovereign prerogative could actually be uh, built into and operate within the terrain of ordinary legal procedures. So for Reynolds, uh, emergency wasn't something episodic or interruptive. Uh, it was a technique of governance embedded into the everyday functionings of colonial regimes. Um, so as I said, my paper takes my, its path of inquiry um, from Benton and Reynolds, um, and it seeks to examine the ways that the repressive measures used by the British colonial state during the First World War um, were part of a much longer um, tradition uh, of colonial power, uh, where so-called emergency uh, measures were actually routinized and embedded into the everyday function of the colonial state. 
Um, so this brings us finally to the First World War. Um, so in March of 1915, the government of India passed the notorious Defense of India Act. Uh, this was modeled after the Defense of Realm Act passed by the British Parliament the previous year. And the Defense of India Act conferred wide ranging powers uh, to colonial authorities to uh, including the suspension of habeas corpus uh, by allowing indefinite uh, detention of political suspects without um, charge or trial. Um, and it also gave uh, colonial authorities the power to conduct uh, political trials using special commissions uh, or tribunals that did not uh, require uh, a jury. Um, although it was made very clear um, that this was only a temporary emergency measure during the war, the government of India took a very controversial decision to uh, extend the Defense of India Act uh, following the war based on the recommendations of the Rowlett Committee. So the Anarchical and Revolutionary Crimes Act, uh, known as the Rowlett Act, provoked uh, widespread outrage across India. It was quickly labeled the Black Act by the Indian public. And the backlash against this was so widespread that it led to violent protests that culminated um, in the infamous Jallianwalabad massacre in Amritsar in April of 19, 1919. So the repressive measures adopted by the British government, both during the war and after under the Rowlett Act, were justified in terms of being exceptional emergency responses to the situation. But as I'm going to demonstrate, this was actually part of a much wider tradition of uh, colonial rule that dates back to the early 19th century. Um, so one of the most common techniques of protecting the state deployed by authorities in times of danger um, are martial law powers. And martial law is often upheld as the premier example of the state of emergency and exception. Um, however, as uh, John Collins has recently shown, uh, martial law was always historically understood, debated, and practiced within the procedures of the law. So as such, uh, according to this understanding, martial law um, isn't a state of exception, but it's an extension of the legal powers granted to officers during periods of emergency. Uh, in the case of the East India Company, martial law uh, powers were part of its original charter uh, in order to help curb the rebellious behavior of its own subjects. Uh, and during the aggressive period of uh, extended warfare and territorial um, aggrandizement for the company in the late 18th and early 19th centuries in India, um, the company saw fit to reaffirm the powers of the governor general to suspend regular law courts, uh, declare martial law and use courts marshals uh, to try individuals um, for hostility, acts of hostility or rebellion against the colonial state. Uh, under uh, Regulation 10 of 1804, which is also known as the Bengal State Offences Regulation. Um, throughout the first half of the 19th century, the company periodically drew upon these martial law powers uh, during its uh, wars against uh, various Mughal successor states in India, uh, and also to suppress uh, revolts against its authority. Um, but of course, the most spectacular use of martial law powers in India occurred during the Indian Uprising or Mutiny of 1857. Um, during this conflict, the widespread nature of the revolt and the desperate position of the British convinced um, the Governor General, Charles Canning, the man on the left here, um, that ordinary martial law powers were insufficient. And so between May and June of 1857, he and his legislative council passed in a series of emergency statutes granting even wider ranging powers to suppress the rebellion. Um, and through these uh, laws, Canning and his um, government not only augmented and expanded the purview of martial law powers available to colonial officers, um, but they also clarified the procedures used in their implementation. And I don't want to overstate um, the extent to which the British adhered to the rule of law um, during the uprising. There were, of course, widespread and egregious abuses of uh, authority, as we can see from the sort of pictures on the, on the right there. Um, but the point I would like to make is that um, the inaction and practice of martial law during this crisis wasn't merely done through sovereign decree, but it was carefully implemented and regulated through the procedures of the law itself. So rather than this being a purely performative manifestation of sovereign power that exists entirely outside the law, according to sort of the Schmidt, Agamben, Walter Benjamin paradigm, uh, martial law was actually an established mechanism of emergency rule. Um, that was ultimately enabled and adjudicated uh, through the law in this case. Um, another key power that's often sought by uh, authorities during times of danger or emergency is preventive detention. Uh, and one of the earliest and most enduring examples of the ways the British regime embedded emergency powers into the everyday functioning of the law um, was through the uh, Regulation 3 of 1880. 
2018, uh, also known as the State Prisoners Act. Uh, so this law enabled the Governor General to suspend habeas corpus and issue warrants for the arrest and detention of any individual uh, suspected of undermining the safety and security of the colonial regime. Uh, one of the most illuminating examples of the use of the colonial state's reliance on this law uh, occurred during the so-called Wahhabi scare of the 1860s and 70s. Um, and this is when the government uh, used the law to uh, arrest and detain Amir and Hasmadad Khan, both of whom were accused of being part of a wide ranging fanatical Muslim anti-colonial conspiracy. Um, when the Khan brothers lawyer mounted a legal challenge against Regulation 3 of 1818, uh, and he demanded a writ of habeas corpus, uh, the high court sided with the government. And the decision by Chief Justice J.P. Norman to deny the writ of habeas corpus is really revealing about the ways emergency measures were built into the everyday workings of the state. So uh, Norman gestured to the numerous wars, conflicts, and other threats the British had faced in India, both before and after the enactment of the Regulation 3 of 1818. And he concluded that this law was indispensable in a country where there was always a permanent danger to the state. Um, and Norman's characterization of the permanent danger allegedly posed to the state thus explicitly acknowledged uh, that it was impossible to distinguish between periods of emergency uh, and non-emergency in India. So in effect, Norman is saying that emergency was the norm in India. Um, following the Indian uprising, uh, India underwent major constitutional changes as sovereignty was transferred from the East India Company to the British Crown. Uh, but many of the problematic issues with the blurring between uh, executive, judicial, and police functions continued. Um, so in 1861, the Indian Councils Act made specific provisions for the Viceroy to retain emergency lawmaking powers in the form of ordinances, and this effectively bypassed the normal legislative framework. Uh, and in a dispatch from August uh, of 1861, Sir Charles Wood, the Secretary of State for India, uh, admitted the extraordinary nature of this power, but emphasized it was absolutely necessary to preserve the security and stability of the British regime. Um, in the decades following the India Councils Act, viceroys generally exercised this power um, very sparingly, um, but it was massively expanded um, during the First World War. Uh, it was used 12 times just between 1914 and 15 alone. Uh, and one of the most notable usages of this was the Ingress into or uh, India Ordinance of 1914, which granted officials the power to restrict uh, the movement of returned immigrants um, by either indefinitely detaining them or confining them to their villages. Uh, during the war, the government also passed the Emergency Legislation Continuance Act, uh, enabling ordinances um, issued during the war to extend beyond their normal six month period of expiry, uh, many of which remained in force until 1922 uh, and weren't officially repealed until 1927. And during the interwar period, the government also continued um, to use uh, um, these uh, repressive capabilities against the growing Indian nationalist um, movement. Um, alongside its continued ability to rule by ordinance and decree, uh, the British colonial states uh, continued to promulgate so-called repressive legislation, which was specifically designed to grant officers powers to deal with persuasive threats to colonial security. Um, so the Murderous Outrages Act of 1867, for instance, a law I've written a lot about, uh, granted colonial officials along India's dangerous northwest frontier wide-ranging discretionary powers to uh, try and execute fanatics uh, who were deemed an existential threat to the state. Uh, and although this law was only meant to be applied uh, to the limited region of the frontier for only a few years, it was gradually expanded both in um, it, it, it being renewed time after time, and its jurisdiction was gradually um, enlarged um, as well. And what's really interesting is that in the early 20th century, when the British were facing uh, revolutionary violence um, in places like Bengal, uh, what we would identify it's now as sort of terrorist violence, um, they used the Murderous Outrages Act as a sort of frame um, for how to frame terrorist violence, um, comparing them often to fanatics. Um, uh, it was also, this law was also used alongside Regulation 3 of 1818 and the Defense of India Act to uh, indefinitely detain prisoners during the First World War. Uh, and following the war, the government of India continued to develop new kinds of repressive legislation uh, to fight against uh, revolutionary violence, uh, terrorist violence. Uh, these included the Bengal Criminal Law Amendment Acts of 1925, uh, the Bengal Criminal Law Arms and Explosives Act of 1932, and the Notorious Suppression of Terrorist Outrages Act of 1932. Um, so I'm going to move now finally to some sort of uh, conclusion. Uh, 
Um, so through the interwar period, the Second World War, right to the end of British rule in 1947, the government of India continued to rely on extraordinary legal powers to arrest, detain, try and convict revolutionaries, enemies of the state, fanatics, um, hereditary criminals, anyone who was deemed uh, threatening to the colonial regime. And as I've hoped to demonstrate in this paper, uh, the British colonial regime's frequent recourse to these kinds of uh, repressive legal measures uh, outside of formally declared um, uh, periods of emergency began well before the First World War, uh, which did not mark so much a turning point as it did the culmination of a wider logic of authoritarian uh, rule. Uh, the durability and longevity of these permanent techniques of emergency ex uh, rule extended well beyond uh, the colonial period into the post-colonial present. Um, so Regulation 3 of 1818, for instance, uh, not only lasted until the final days of the Raj, but it was also retained by independent India until 1952, when it was replaced with similar legislation. Um, since independence, both Pakistan and India have continued to regularly deploy draconian powers, preventive detention, uh, other repressive legal measures to uh, maintain order and control. Uh, both the Indian Constitution of 1950 and various Pakistani constitutions promulgated between 1956 um, and 1973 drew upon British constitutional precedents uh, and retained various emergency provisions. Um, more recently, the logic of perpetual colonial emergency has been replaced by a logic um, of anti-terrorism. So the Indian Prevention of Terrorism Act of 2002, for instance, built upon colonial precedents uh, and was widely used to persecute even ordinary criminals rather than terrorism-related offenses before its repeal in 2004. So, when we look at the repressive legislation and use of emergency powers during peacetime in the colonial world, through the lens of the metropole, these kinds of actions invariably seem exceptional. However, I argue if we adopt the vantage point of the colony itself, a very different picture emerges. In a context where force, repression, and violence were the norm, uh, laws like Regulation 3, um, the Murderous Outrages Act, the Ingress into India Ordinance, or the Defense of India Act, were simply products of a wider logic of colonialism. As an autocratic authoritarian regime obsessed with maintaining its own stability at any cost, the British colonial state in India privileged security and embedded these into the everyday uh, governing, into its everyday governing fabric. Uh, the colonial world was organized along an entirely different legal register from the metropole, which is why attempts to understand it through the exception are less productive than looking to ways in which it was the site for the creation of new kinds of statecraft and legal innovation. And from this vantage point, we might also actually turn the mirror back against Europe itself and argue that the reason the First World War is seen as such a turning point in modern statecraft by Agamben and others is because this is a moment when Europe began to resemble less a metropolitan space uh, and more of a colonial one. Um, so the blurring between war and peace, between executive, legislative and judicial functions, and the existence of a state of permanent emergency is not something unique um, to the per post um, uh, First World War, or even post 9-11 world. Um, but it has been a distinctive feature of colonial rule uh, for centuries. Um, so I'll end it there um, and look forward to um, uh, Alistair's comments uh, and your, your questions. Thanks. Um, OK, um, so I can I can jump in now, I think. Um, uh, so thanks, um, Mark, for first asking me to comment on, on what was a really enjoyable and, and stimulating paper. So I've, I've read the wider paper, so my comments will pertain to some of those things, but I'll make sure that they, they centre on what we've heard, heard today. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting and apt that we're thinking about some of these questions in our current climate, right, where questions of emergency and state power are very much part of public discourse. Um, I um, So as Mark points out, um, he's his Recent work builds on a really important set of, I think, uh, uh, recent scholarship um, that has gone a long way to dispel the idea that the, that the rule of law was anything other than a discourse attached to uh, the civilizing mission in, in, many, in, many, in many kind of colonial histories. But it's been much more powerful, I think, in, than simply holding up the idea of colonial promise to colonial practice. Um, what it's done, I think, and what Mark's work does really powerfully in this, in this paper is it forces us uh, or forces a particular set of historical assumptions that I think were held in a certain liberal reading of, of 19th, 20th century world history to take more seriously the importance of histories that predated the sort of crises that happened in Europe in the 20th century. And that in this context is the colony, India and empire. 
And that I think is, is a really powerful argument. What it does, as Mark was saying in his paper, is, is it decenters Europe as the primary site for original experiments in exception, in sovereignty and state violence, and asks us to bring forth the colony, not as a peripheral space, but as actually the central space. And that I think is a really important argument. Um, and then the other argument, which he, which, which I think is really powerful, and again, I think is very is is the one we have to think, take more seriously, is that he convincingly demonstrates that an anxiety that some scholars are, are kind of coming to now in the post 9/11 world about permanent exception, perpetual emergency, a sudden, a kind of a sudden unsteadying of modern conceptions of civil liberties and the rule of law when framed with a short historical lens are only really possible because like we said, the empire is not taken seriously in those histories. And so what I thought from someone who is interested in South Asia primarily, what I thought was uh, most exciting or maybe not most exciting, but was exciting about the paper was that what Mark does is he takes a, such a huge event like World War I and says, actually, we need to think about specific laws like in the paper, he talks about the Criminal Tribes Act, which affects a particular community, or the Regulation 3 of 1818, the State Prisoners Act, and says that World War I's history has to take, has to engage in these histories that, are, that, that affected um, communities or people in, in, in 19th century India. And that I think is a really uh, useful way to think about the deeper histories of World War I outside of, of a European context. So I've just got um, two questions, or a question and then a kind of a problem that I'll just pose to, to kind of begin the conversation. And, um, and these are things that piqued my interest, and I will admit they, they, have, uh, they speak to my own research interests, so um, there's a little bit of selfishness there. Um, what I wanted to hear a little bit more about is in the paper, you, Mark, you talk a little bit about the way in which there is a routinization of emergency in, in the context of the British Empire, and in this case, India. And when I read the paper, it does a, the wider paper does a really good job of laying out the ways in which if you start in 1818, you can just see the colonial state, once it gets a taste for these emergency powers, just build, builds more and more and more of them, right? So you start with 1818, then you talk about the Thuggy Act, then Mopler Act, then Criminal Tribes Act, Citizens Meetings Act, Murders Act, Rages Act, Criminal Law, you know, they, they go on and on and on, right? Rowell Act, right up, up until today. And to me, that is an argument that's not about just a bleeding of exceptionality into the everyday. It's about the, ex the expanding of the exception constantly. The question I have here is, a, is kind of a methodological question. And I wonder whether, is there a possibility in, because what I think the law does really effectively is it defines for itself what is the emergency and what is the political, what, is, what are political crimes and what are non-political crimes. And then actually, I think one of the things I was wondering is if we follow those laws too strictly, do we miss the ways in which the types of legal practices and procedures that don't define them, that aren't defined as emergencies or aren't put as either political, actually in substantial terms really resemble the same things? So I'm thinking about everyday practices, right? So the ways in which in the colony, the magistrate can have, you know, not if it's for petty crimes, can have hugely wide discretionary authority, that there will be, you know, low, lots and lots and lots of under trial prisoners who would never have seen the court, right? There would be you know, as we, we talked in the past, right, whipping or capital, capital punishment happens on such a wider scale. If you have a legal defense in, in the metropole, often you won't have it in, um, in the colony. And these are not like, these are not defined as emergency practices. They're not necessarily targeting political actors, but the nature of being a colonial subject means that what is an emergency in this, maybe in the metropole can just be every day in the colony. So I was, the question I have in that sense is, is, the, is, it, is it important? To what degree can you also bring in everyday practices which aren't in that genealogy of emergency into the into the frame of your analysis? Um, and the second question I have is is something which uh, again I thought about when you were talking, and, and it's about the critique you have of Ogembin and Schmidt, which I think is very well well taken and, and important. And when I read the paper, I read it again this morning, and I and it hit me again. And it's just so interesting to me that. The moment that someone like a Gem the type the World War One, which is the moment that someone like a Gembin can say until recently without too much pushback that this is the turning point of world history towards new forms of emergency, is precisely the moment, like you say in your paper, that someone like Jinnah or Gandhi would actually turn against empire for the first time fully. Right? And they'll say, this is actually, we'll give up any kind of loyalty to empire is over now. And we're going to move towards a new form of political imaginary, which is decolonization essentially, right? And the fact that the moment in which an again we can see this anxiety of emergency is the moment which a Gandhi or a Jinnah will start to see new worlds of political life which separate themselves from the colony. I don't know what to do with that, but to me, I think it makes again but even more problematic that he can't see that there was an opportunity there for people outside of Europe to think differently about politics, about rights, um, and 
So I don't know what to do with that, but I, I wanted to ask whether you thought there was something, whether we can push again, but even harder, not that he's some imperialist, but there's something about it which I think is deeply troubling that he can't seem to see those histories in, in his writing. So those were the two the two comments, but I really enjoyed the paper. I thought it was very rich and I, and I, and I learned a lot from it. So thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank, thanks so much. Oh, Mark, I'm just going to say before I let you jump in, just remind the audience that, um, yeah, Mark, I'll let you respond to Alistair's mm -hmm. comments now, but the audience, if you have any questions or comments of this fascinating talk or and discussion points, just please raise your hand or put it in the chat box. But now, Mark, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Um, I, I, I increased the volume on my mic, um, but I, is this okay? People can hear? Okay. Um, so yeah, Alistair, uh, thanks again for your, your really um, enthusiastic and, and, and detailed engagement with this. Um, in response to your first question, uh, yeah, I think definitely we can't just look to sort of these big um, emergency laws or laws that are, you know, designed uh, to deal with political crimes and, and, and high stakes things. And we actually have to look to the embeddedness of this in everyday practice, as you said. Um, and the Criminal Tribes Act, I think, is a good example of this, right? Because I, I didn't have time to talk about it in the uh, the talk I just gave, but I do I do mention it briefly in my, my paper. But you know, this is a law. It's not conceived as an emergency. But the British say that well, there's this pervasive threat by all these wandering bands of criminals across northern India, and we can tell them by their 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 tribe, their caste, whatever else. So we need to regulate them, and this is this is done through a law that stays in place throughout the rest of colonial rule. Um, it, it stays in place into independent India under the Habitual Offenders Act. Um, and it defines the daily existence of people who are labeled uh, as threatening under this law. They have to report to a police magistrate if he demands it, he can imprison them arbitrarily. So as, as Alistair said, you know, this, this everyday law in a way gives extraordinary executive power and authority to uh, colonial officials. Uh, Radhika Singh has written recently about this, which I think is really good uh, work. Um, and, and to me, what's really interesting is that this is a codified law. This happens after codification begins in India. And codification, in theory, is meant to erode um, arbitrary sovereignty and arbitrary dis uh, discretion it, when it comes to the application and enforcement of the law. Um, but the men who are drafting co these codified laws are men like Henry Maine and James Fitzjames Stephen. And the treatise on law, where he very clearly states that he doesn't see codified laws as necessarily eroding executive power and discretion. He sees it as strengthening them. them. So for him, you, you can give the officer a great deal of power through the letter of the law. And there's a fundamental tension here between Stephen's approach and how, say, Carl Schmidt would define discretionary uh, authority. Because Schmidt, in the Agamben paradigm, it's all about the sovereign being completely outside of the law. He doesn't have the prerogative, the discretion, um, except for that there's no law defining and holding him. Whereas Stephen and the colonial state actually tried to process that into the everyday workings uh, of the law. And that is, again, why I think it is important that we look to these more mundane, everyday um, sort of uh, legal practices. Uh, and yeah, that's something I'd be very happy to expand on more in, in future work. But uh, yeah, as I said, this piece is, is geared towards the First World War. So I, I decided to take a sort of long durée look at sort of big legal um, innovations and, and changes. Um, in terms of this question about, um, you know, crisis of empire, Agamben seen this also as the beginning of a crisis of, of sort of democracy um, in, uh, in the metropoles. Uh, I think it's really interesting. I, I've still been mulling it over since you first proposed this to me. Um, and one has to wonder, I think, in a lot of ways, you know, why does, why does the, why do the British and French colonial states, for instance, why do they resort so much more to emergency powers in the colonies after the First World War, and particularly after the Second World War? It's because they face sustained um, nationalist uh, decolonization movements, right? And they need emergency powers in their arsenal. The states of emergency are enacted in Malaya, Kenya, um, Palestine, uh, Algeria, of course, Indochina. Um, and so it, one, I, I'd be very curious to look more into this um, sort of relationship between this, but the extent to which the authoritarianism of European states is actually a product of them clamping down on these, these decolonization, these liberation movements. And uh, to what extent, again, the colonial world is um, 
being a, a driver of change and, and, and prompting greater authoritarianism from metropolitan states like, like Britain and France. But I haven't, I haven't thought enough about this, but I think it's a really interesting sort of avenue to, to look down um, for sort of future research. Um, so I'll end my, my responses to you there, Alistair, but I, I'm sure we'll come back to these in, in future discussions. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question now from Hillary. Hillary, did you want to ask it live? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. A great presentation. You know, I'm super interested in your work. And thanks, Alistair, for the comments. Um, I, I, I find your argument very persuasive. And my question really is about two, I know you use India as your case study to go into depth. But to what extent would you argue that these practices and, and these processes are um, representative of the overall British imperial approach? So it is representative of British empire and not uniquely associated to the British relationship with India? Um, thanks for that, that question, Hillary. Um, you know, I, India is, is sort of my, my main area of expertise still, obviously. So that's that's why I always go back to it. But I have been reading up a lot uh, recently about, I, I've just been reading, uh, rereading uh, um, David Anderson's Histories of the Hanged on, on the Kenya emergency, uh, which is all about the use of law there um, in sort of the show trials against Mao Mao suspects. Um, and as I was sort of saying in response to Alistair's question, emergency is sort of the, the go-to um, method of, of power um, during the, wars of decolonization in the 19 um at the end of 1940s 50s and 60s so there's emergency as i said in malaya palestine um and Aden in cyprus um in kenya uh i'm not sure if they do uh, there's an emergency in rhodesia at some point it wouldn't surprise me uh, it's same thing in the french empire in in algeria and in indochina uh, the portuguese de declare emergencies in in, in angola um, so emergency becomes like a governing framework, basically, to, to maintain authoritarian control in the face of increasingly democratic anti-colonial um, movements. Um, one thing I think would be interesting to look at, however, is maybe the differences in the way emergency powers are deployed um, between different colonial states. So, you know, places like Kenya and Algeria are settler colonies, and there's very different racial dynamics there that are at play than, say, in India. Um, and the way the law operates in terms of emergency procedures there, I think would be interesting. There's of course differences between the French empire and the British, right? The British always eschew this image of militarism. They say that, you know, they're, they're like Athens, they're commercial free traders and that's what their empire is about. Whereas the French are always tarred with this brush of being extremely militaristic. And to some extent that is true. The military had a huge amount of authority and power in, in places like Algeria for much longer. Um, and uh, in the Algerian case, um, when the emergency is declared there during the Algerian War of Independence, the military basically takes over the entire government of the colony. Um, whereas in a place like Kenya, what's interesting is that the military works very closely aside this, uh, beside the civil government, but it's not that the military takes over all, altogether, um, which I think is a, a misperception too. When people think of martial law, it's that the civil government is completely subsumed. Martial law, actually civil powers um, often, from what I've seen in different emergencies, work alongside the military, and they're used as, as sort of supplementary authority to, to prosecute martial law. So in 1857 in India, um, civil officers are given martial law powers um, because they, they realize that there's not enough military officers to fight rebels and to hang them at the same time. Um, and, you know, you said you're interested in, in 1919 in Amritsar. Um, you know, my, my friend and colleague Kim Wagner, his book, which I, I think is really brilliant and really interesting, is he, first of all, he finds out that, you know, martial law wasn't declared by the time this massacre took place uh, at, at Jalian Wallapai. Dyer was, the civil law was fully in effect after that. And even after martial law was declared, um, the civilian administration still kept um, functioning, um, which is, again, why I don't think we can just see martial law as this period of lawlessness where the military just takes over. There is a, a lot of collaboration and functioning between civil administrations and, and the military is still there. So that's my very discursive rambling answer to your question, Hillary, but I'd be happy to talk more about this um, in future.
No, it's great. And it made me think as well of the case in um, British Honduras during the same time where the, the police, there was close collaboration between the civil authorities and the police as well there, partly because they just didn't, the British didn't have enough of their own forces uh, to comprehensively um, implement things like martial law even after the uprising in 1919. So, yeah, I would love to discuss this with you sometime. Uh, yeah, sure. Great. Um, so we have also another follow up question from an uh, audience member, and then I'm going to abuse my position as chair to ask a question of my own, Mark. Um, so one of the audience members said very concerning when so called exceptional powers promulgated within wartime are held and carried into peacetime visa post World War One. You mentioned that Pakistan kept such power post independence and India. Uh, so what British draconian laws have been continued till now in India and Pakistan? So I guess maybe the legacy of these. Mm -hmm. And then my yeah. question is just to pull, sorry, is just to pull more on your conversation you had with Hillary too around the indigenous collaborators, I guess, like how does racial logic kind of separate, you know, from the um, dangerous, suspicious kind of indigenous to someone that, you know, a hierarchy, someone that we can trust to administer or help administer the, these sorts of laws. I just wonder the racial dynamics that played into producing hierarchies of indigenous people too. So great, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, um, so I'll, I'll answer Leslie's question first. Um, so I, I tried to touch on this a little bit in my, my conclusion, which I of course um, had to cut down a lot from the original paper. Um, and I, I'm blanking on all the, I, I, in the original paper, I've, I've listed a whole bunch of laws actually that um, India or Pakistan either retained after independence and then just sort of changed the wording around a bit or essentially replaced um, these laws, these draconian laws with um, new ones along the exact same line. So I think the, the 2002 Terrorist Prevention Act um, is one of the examples I mentioned in the case of India. Um, in the case of Pakistan, one thing I was really floored to discover when I was first writing about the Murderous Outrages Act, I, I, I started coming to this at the end of my PhD around 2013, uh, and that Pakistan still had this on its statute books. They still had the 1867 Murderous Outrages Act um, in place in, in what was then the federally administered tribal areas, so uh, along the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and they were using this in the war on terror. So you could literally see a colonial law designed against Muslim fanatics um, and it's it, it being reprocessed and carried on in, in the contemporary war of terror. So in, in that case, not just the discursive and legal category of fanatics informing what a modern day terrorist is, but the same law being used. Um, I mean, I, I don't have enough information on how, what, how much it was used, but it was still on the statute books um, when I was researching back then. So that, that to me was really, really striking. Um, in other cases, I mean, uh, the Indian Penal Code is a, is a good example of continuation of colonial law. So this was, you know, written first in 1860, drafted originally in 1830. Um, and like lots of colonial era laws, you know, it, it criminalized homosexuality. There's big problems in, in African countries where, you know, this is in the British law, um, you know, cr criminalization of homosexuality, other things. Um, but the Indian Penal Code also has sections of the law that are specifically designed to protect the state against sedition. Um, uh, and you know, the British use this very, very widely during the Indian nationalist movement to arrest figures like Gandhi, uh, Nehru, um, and others who are agitating for freedoms. And uh, I think it's 123B, 123A is the section of the Indian Penal Code on sedition. Um, and the current Indian government is using that to arrest uh, farmers right now in farmers protests. Um, uh, just a little more contemporary stuff, uh, the, the controversy with Greta Thunberg and Rihanna who, who, who put their support behind uh, the farmers movement. Um, uh, there was a, uh, an FR, uh, FIR report done by the, the Delhi police on Rihanna and Greta Thunberg under this section of this colonial era law for sedition. Um, so the, the post-colonial states have inherited these colonial legal systems. And I would say they've inherited a lot of the authoritarianism of uh, the colonial rulers beforehand in using them. Um, so I, ho I hope that answers um, your, your question, Leslie. Um, so Amanda, in your that, question was about um, sort of- Sorry. Sorry? Is, that also, is that also being used, that law against journalists who are, who are covering um, um, the, the farmers thing and coming with opinions that the government doesn't like? Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, it's very wide ranging. It's it's about sedition. So, and sedition, of course, is not defined in the law. Um, sort of like the term fanatic is not defined in the Murderous Outrages Act. So it gives enormous, again, discretion for local authorities to define what is um, sedition. Uh, and another sort of charge that we will often see against people protesting um, government actions in India these days is being anti-national. Um, so I remember when I was uh, in Delhi around 2013 or 14, I think this is when there were protests at JNU uh, and Kanaya Kumar was um, arrested, a student sort of activist, um, under the same colonial era sedition law as, as Gandhi was. Um, so you can see very clear continuity, but you know, instead of now of them being nationalist leaders who are fighting, it's, it's people who are criticizing the government um, being locked up under these laws. Uh, does that answer your question, Leslie? Yes. Okay, yes, I'll you. take that as a yes. All right. Um, so Amanda, your, your question about indigenous collaborators. So this has been something you know discussed by scholars since the old cambridge school of the 1970s right um and it's been a sort of very highly politicized debate uh, in some ways about how we approach this topic but you know as gandhi himself recognized empire doesn't work unless the colonized people um collaborate and, and cooperate um and this is what his brand of nationalist politics was about was you know Hartel's big strikes shut down the country if you don't work with the British they can't they can't function um, and the British the French whatever colonizing power they're always very good about enlisting certain groups um, patronizing them um, making sure they were beneficiaries of colonial rule and then they would then also enforce colonial rule amongst other people within them so uh, the British had sort of princes in the princely states in India they had martial races of course as uh, you, you you write about in your own research um, to, to keep these groups off one another they, they would also sort of you know favor more moderate politicians um, whatever it was in places like Kenya the British colonial state um, used uh, traditional tribal chiefs, elders, headmen, these sorts of things as, as bulwarks for um, the colonial regime uh, against sort of the nationalist movements of Kenyatta and the more militant wing of, of the Mau Mau. Um, and I think this is, this is why, um, you know, colonial struggles are very complex because uh, who, is, who, is the, who constitutes the nation, who is fighting for freedom is very different because there are lots of groups within these countries that don't see themselves um, uh, as being on the side of the nationalists. The nationalists are constantly having divisions amongst themselves. Um, and in some ways, you know, some people argue that uh, wars of decolonization in places like Zimbabwe and Kenya are actually in a lot of ways civil wars between these different indigenous communities who have been uh, divided and ruled by the colonial regime and have exacerbated uh, existing socioeconomic, political um, and historic tensions between um, different groups. And there's this huge fallout, of course, today in the, the post-colonial world because of these, these divisions. Um, I, hopefully that sort of answered a bit what you were, you were asking about, Amanda. Oh, sorry, you wanted to know more about who we discern as loyal and who is it, right? Was that? Yeah, just, I mean, the, the messiness of what Alistair mm -hmm. says the everyday too, right? The ways in which mm -hmm. these racial, gender, caste kind of um, politics mm -hmm. play into how, how, you know, and that relationship, that ambivalence, right, of who's mm -hmm. de determined loyal or, uh, or mm -hmm. trustworthy otherwise. Yeah, so the, you know, the British often looked for the sort of traditional uh, brokers of authority and power. So, um, you know, in the early 19th century, they patronized sort of high caste Brahmin groups um, who they saw were the natural leaders. And, you know, if we want to institute change, we convince them first and then they'll do a sort of, uh, it'll trickle down. Um, you know, in the case of martial races, right, you know, whether it's Sikhs or Gurkhas or um, Punjabi Muslims, these are groups who stood by the British in a time of crisis, uh, helped them suppress the uprising of 1857 and therefore are very much rewarded um, as a result of that. Um, but what's interesting is, you know, these who is loyal, who is not is, is very complicated because in the case of Sikhs, for instance, the British uphold them as the premier martial race, the, the most loyal of the loyal. Punjab is the, the, the nursery of their, their post-1857 Indian army. But at the same time, as I've written about in my book, they remain acutely anxious that, you know, if the Sikhs are unhappy, if there's a revolt here, the entire empire will crumble because we've put all our eggs in one basket. 
Um, and so the British bend over backwards to keep certain groups content um, in places like, like Punjab, um, especially when it comes to the Sikh community, which of course leads to massive economic infrastructure development with canal colonies um, and essentially leads to the militarization of Punjabi society, which then Pakistan inherited at partition, a very overstrong, overpowerful uh, military that had its uh, teeth into rural society, politics, economy, um, and is one of the reasons Pakistan has had so many uh, military coups and, and periods of, of military rule um, since the post-colonial period. Um, but yeah, the question of loyalty is always very difficult. And even groups that somehow were collaborators could often be playing the colonizers off against themselves, um, taking advantage of them. Um, you know, martial races, Pashtuns, for instance, were a martial race, right? But lots of Pashtuns would join the British service. They would get the new fancy rifles and weapons, and they would just abscond and then use them to shoot at the British, right? Um, there were lots of tribal chiefs in Kenya who were happy to take British money uh, and just continue to do their own thing. So there, there are lots of acts of resistance, even within these uh, so-called collaborators and collaborator networks. Great, thank you. And then, of course, Hillary is putting comments, you know, just this uh, to further unpack, right, um, how we understand collab you know, motivations of aligning or otherwise or yeah so the, the 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 everyday messiness of all of this which is which is fascinating right so yeah mm -hmm. great thank you so um matilda i don't know if you had your hand up or not did you want to ask a question yeah i did um mark thank you so much for this um talk um really interesting and um i i actually have two points um one is more of a comment and then the other one is a question um, so the, the thing that you raised about, um, I, I'm not sure if it was the Regulation 3 Act or something right after, um, uh, in terms of the preventive detention, which was used about times between 1914 and 15, um, the way that it was, or as far as I could read what it said on the, um, on, on the slide, there, there seem to be a lot of parallels in the wording um, in terms of security narratives um, towards people coming in from the outside into the British Raj with um, what we see in European border politics nowadays. Um, so, so those narratives, they, they, it, it struck me a little that that it was so obvious that you could could find them um, in today's in today's narratives of how to preventively, um, I don't know, capture and detain people who might actually be a form of I don't know national or pose some sort of national security um, problem or issue or whatever. Um, so I was just wondering whether, um, I mean, one thing is to compare those, right, compare, compare those two narratives and try to understand um, what, let's say, colonial um, underlying structures we might find in there, but I wonder what, you know, what larger implications this might actually have for the evolvement of security as a whole, um, like for today's security politics. Um, and then the other thing um, which I wanted to ask you was um, because you were talking about um, the, the use of um, certain colonial um, laws in post-colonial India and Pakistan. Um, I just wonder whether you see any, you know, any process or, you know, any, any developments in terms of that the Hindutva uh, movement, um, you know, led by Modi or the BJP is kind of using, starts to use more of these um, post-colonial laws or co no, formerly colonial laws than, um, I don't know, I'd say more moderate governments before, let's say under Singh or whoever else. I just, I'm just interested whether you see there's a parallel between these nationalist movements and the use of these laws. Okay, thanks um, for the, those questions. Um, I'll, I think I'll go to the first one, um, which I think is interesting, this question of borders and border crossing. And I would say um, this has always been a concern and a source of anxiety um, for states um, and particularly colonial states, because you know a state, it wants to have people fixed in a certain area so they know exactly how many people are there, how much they can tax, they, they can know who they are, whether they're threatening or not. But when people move across porous borders, um, 
this presents a problem for the state and they don't know, you know, if there's, uh, you know, economic smuggling going on, if there's threatening political ideas moving back and forth. Um, so borders have always been a concern, at least in colonial India. Um, you know, I've, I've written a lot about the Northwest frontier, which um, between was British India and Afghanistan at the time, the British were of course very worried about fanaticism and, and sort of Muslim extremists coming in from Afghanistan across um, these borders. Um, they're very worried about um, smuggling and criminality across the internal borders in India because there's princely states at this time which are semi-independent um, and the British actually have to have extradition treaties with these Indian princely states to get criminals back. Um, Eric Bradley's written about this uh, in the case of Hyderabad and this caused conflicts between the British colonial state and these internal other princely states. Um, there's also French territory in India at this time as well and the uh, the British were very, very worried um, in the case of a, a place called Chandranagore, which is a suburb of Calcutta, essentially, which was a, har a haven for revolutionary activity in the early 20th century. And this is because it was under French jurisdiction and revolutionaries could uh, order weapons, print propaganda, uh, plan attacks in French territory, carry them out in British territory and just cross the border and the British couldn't do anything about it. Um, so borders are always uh, a key concern for states and controlling them. And we can see, you know, the ingress into India ordinance in the First World War. This was because the British were worried about radicalized Indians, particularly Gadar party members from the west coast of Canada and the United States coming back into India during the war and fomenting uprising and insurrection, which they in indeed tried uh, to do. Um, and so, yeah, Regulation 3 of, is part of that, right? It's part of this expansive fear uh, of, um, you know, destabilizing elements, crossing borders, which were very fluid at the time it was drafted in 1818. This was uh, a period of big territorial conquest, and the British were still sorting out everything. And I think one that they wanted to do is give themselves as much leeway as possible to control the movement of people. Um, and yeah, of course, today, um, whether it's, you know, the US border with Mexico or, you know, the, the UK border um, with the entire rest of the world, as, as it were, um, there is, I think that we can see the same concerns about uh, states. Um, in terms of whether there's a sort of continuation of, of colonial logic there, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I haven't thought about that so much. Um, but it, it might be an interesting thing to think more deeply about. Um, in terms of your question about, um, you know, do sort of more authoritarian right-wing groups like, you know, the, uh, the, the RSS, for instance, um, uh, resort to draconian laws more authoritatively or more, more frequently. Um, I would say it seems that way right now, but if you look at the history of post-colonial India, for instance, um, one of the biggest um, abuses of uh, liberty was done by the Congress party, the party of Gandhi and, and, and Nehru by Indira Gandhi um, in the Indian emergency when she literally suspended the constitution, declared that elections had been rigged against her. Um, and it was emergency rule in, from, what was it, 50, 75 to 77, Alistair? Um, uh, emergency rule in India in the 20th century. And that was done by the so-called good guys, as it were. Um, so I think it's not necessarily one side or the other, but what I think is dangerous is when states have these executive powers, they have this broad framework of emergency to work with. Um, and this is the thing Gom Agamben points to, the, is that when, as states acquire these more expansive powers, they're very loath to give them up. And it's the same thing with colonial states. And this is why these repressive laws, they stay on the statute books for over hundreds of years. Um, there's Indian nationalists in the 20s and 30s, and they're writing, why does Regulation 3 still exist? This is absolutely archaic to modern conceptions of political liberty. But states don't want to give up these extraordinary powers once they have them, because they can draw upon them whenever they're challenged. And depending on their commitment to democracy or not, um, we'll, we'll use them um, against those they, they see as threatening to, to their rule. That's what an amazing conversation. And I think this brings us back to Alan James's point before he had to scoot off too, is that, um, you know, a broader discussion around this blurring between war and peace and, um, you know, um, that, that we're talking about is not just pronounced the farther away from Europe, but it also gets, um, um, but also how far into the past beyond the 19th century. Like, so the continuity is right in the ways in which we can, um, lessons learned of how um, governance uh, in, in India, but also, you know, similar strategies around how crisis is understood and how security threats are understood full stop. 
um, states in the global north to global south um, more broadly too. So I've personally learned so much today, Mark, Alistair, and wicked smart questions from the audience too. So thank you so much to Mark and Alistair specifically, and then um, also the audience more generally for um, you know this intellectually vibrating lunch hour. So I want to thank you all for coming. And next Wednesday, we have another um, uh, new voices. So please, it's the same link, I believe. So please come along to that as well. Um, I guess Mark and Alistair, I'll give you the final words before we sign off. I'd just say thank you for Amanda for organizing this and inviting me and uh, for Alistair for staying up so late to uh, participate in this discussion and, and for all of you for joining and, and asking your questions. Um, this was a really good forum to sort of sound out, think through some of these ideas that I'm still working with on this article. So thank you all. I want to say thank you both to Mark and Amanda for having me, and um, I really enjoyed it. It was, and it's not too late. It's only, it's about nine thirty, so it's fine. I've just.